Our Bible reading is, is going to be in two parts again. Um, the first will be in Habakkuk chapter 3. That's page 786 in the church Bibles. And after that we will move on to Philippians 4, 10 to 20. So starting with Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk 3, starting at verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear? In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timan and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendour covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth, he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low, his were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the lands of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place, at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury, you threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the pure in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And we move to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, starting at verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situ situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the Gospel, when I left Macedonia, 
No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. To our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, if you would turn in your Bibles to that reading we have from the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, a minor prophet, and especially those words in verses 17 to 19. Now this chapter is clearly a hymn. At the end of the chapter, Habakkuk tells those who would join in singing this hymn how it should be sung, uh, the tune, and he wants us to able to take the same hymn on our lips with sincerity. These same verses, these same words. It's the most lovely conclusion to this book. And yet also these words which we have there in verses 17 to 19 are very challenging, very challenging words. Really this conclusion challenges our walk with God, our experience of God and our expectations as the people of God. And I want us to see tonight that Habakkuk has got to this blessed point through the Lord's dealings with him and how it is that he's arrived at this point and how we should desire to know what Habakkuk knew in our lives and in our experience. But it's not always easy to find this blessed place that Habakkuk found as a result of the Lord's dealings with him. Yet it's something I believe God wants us to know. God wants us to know the experience that Habakkuk had, though it can seem elusive, at times it can seem far from us, yet his word points us to it on many occasions. And it's a place which we should desire to know and enjoy as the people of God. So our title tonight is this, Habakkuk's Best Place. Habakkuk's Best Place. Three points, we have three points this morning, three points tonight. Firstly, Habakkuk's journey to the best place. Secondly, the contentment of the best place. And thirdly, do we know the best place? Do we know the best place for ourselves? Well, firstly, Habakkuk's journey to the best place. We see this amazing contrast between the beginning of the book and the end. We often find this in the word of God with the psalmist. There's this tremendous perplexity but in the end, they come to a point of rest and peace. And at the beginning of the book, Habakkuk is so distressed as he sees the terrible wickedness of Judah, the people of God. It seems that this great wickedness of God's people is running riot and it's going unchecked. There's idolatry, child sacrifice, self-seeking, injustice and abuse and he's cried to God the prophet has cried to God and it seems that God isn't listening chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong destruction and violence are before me strife and contention arise he's surrounded by wickedness well God does answer Habakkuk does come to him and he answers him and he's told that as Israel has departed from God according to God's law they will now suffer invasion and captivity God will keep his word so he reassures Habakkuk showing him how he will soon send the Babylonians to judge and deal with his wicked people 
But then this has Habakkuk further alarmed. To think that God would use such a wicked people. A people who are worse in his eyes than his own people. The Babylonians as his instrument of chastisement and judgment upon the people of God. How can one who is of purer eyes than to behold evil, chapter 1 and verse 13, how can one who is such a God, who can't look on wickedness and behold evil, how can he use such men? Well, we know that God can in no way promote sin. He does not tempt men. He doesn't cause men to sin. He hates sin. The work of the Babylonians is hateful to God. He will not encourage them to do the evil things that they will do. They do them of their own free will, and so they'll be held responsible. Yet in the end, they do what God has ordained and what God has said they will do. We see this clearly at the cross, don't we? The cross of Christ. We see there that God in no way forced the hand of the Pharisees or the Jews. He didn't coerce them. He wasn't party to their sin. Yet in the end, all they did was what? What God had ordained. What God had planned before the world began. This is beyond us. It's beyond us. How can these things both be true? God can have nothing to do with wickedness. And yet God uses the wickedness of men in his plan. We can't fully reconcile these things. It shows us how much greater God this is than us. And yet it's true. It's all true. But having taken his next concern, God's use of the Babylonians to the mercy seat in prayer, Habakkuk now acts like a man ascending a high place or a watchtower or a rampart, chapter 2 and verse 1. And he will stand in order to be the first one to receive what it is that God will reply to him concerning this thing. And again, God reveals his truth to him. He sends him a vision as an answer. Yet the answer is not what Habakkuk or we might expect. He isn't told what I've just told you, which is revealed elsewhere in the word of God concerning how God uses wickedness but can have nothing to do with it. Instead, he receives this revelation, which is at the heart of the whole Bible. He learns that the just shall live by faith. Chapter 2, verse 4, Behold, the wicked, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous, or the just, shall live by his faith. Habakkuk, I will use these Babylonians to punish and chasten my wicked people. Many may wonder what I'm doing, but do not fret Habakkuk. Trust me. Remember Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. Have faith, Habakkuk. Believe me, trust me, believe my promises, I will not fail you. Well, this has reassured Habakkuk, it's reassured him, but also caused him to be then exercised further. He's reassured as to how God will deal with the wicked, but then again, he's concerned for the righteous. Think of that remnant that we thought of this morning, the righteous, the people of God who are in Judah, who will be caught up in this terrible judgment. So he cries, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Lord, in wrath, remember mercy, he cries. Chapter 3, verse 2. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, in the midst of the years of Judah's destruction, in the midst of the years of her captivity, Lord, preserve your work. Preserve a remnant. Preserve the faithful, those who do walk by faith, who live by faith. And again, so gracious is this God that he then responds to Habakkuk and he gives him this further vision which we read tonight of God himself going out as this great judge to deal with the wicked and yet to deliver his people to be a savior to his people to the faithful 
Chapter 3, verse 13, you went out for the salvation of, the, of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. God goes out, he's able to distinguish, he's able to keep a people and yet deal with the wicked. We can think how ones like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and uh, we can think how uh, ones like Ezekiel and these ones were kept, were preserved. During that great time, the God, God preserved them. With all the blood, all the sieges, the siege towers, the war cries, people being led away in chains, the dead dying, even eventually the overthrow of Babylon, which Habakkuk is shown. God promises he will trample the nations in his anger. And yet he will most assuredly go forth for the salvation of his people, preserving a remnant, those who walk by faith, and so most assuredly in his wrath, remembering his mercy. Well, how gracious this God has been to his prophet. Having seen the truth that God is not unaware of all that is taking place, and he will deal with wickedness, perfectly and righteously having seen this great God will go out with those armies that act in vengeance against the wicked and yet save his people those who walk by faith Habakkuk is content Habakkuk is at peace and as a result of God's dealings with him Habakkuk has found this refuge he's come into the best place what is it Chapter 3, verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. What is the best place that Habakkuk has come to as a result of all this? It's the place of implicit trust, dependence and faith in God despite our circumstances. That's his journey, Habakkuk's journey to the best place. But secondly, the contentment, the contentment of the best place. It's wonderful what Habakkuk can say now regarding the frame of mind that he is in. He declares really this, doesn't he? He says, though all the means or resources of food fail, whether as a result of the Babylonian siege and the ravages of the invader, or whether just through the unusual, or the usual circumstances of the coming years, even if all the staple foods are cut off, nonetheless, Habakkuk is going to trust in this glorious God who has wonderfully revealed to him his wisdom, his power, his righteousness and his mercy. He believes that in the worst calamities of life he can yet rely on his God and look to him. Though having to walk through tribulations, he believes God will yet give him grace to keep him going. And like a deer, to remain standing on his feet as a deer darting through the forest or walking on a slippery mountain slope would be of such nimble feet that it does not crash into trees or slip on the rocky path and so fall. God will yet preserve his steps. As he looks to him, he won't stumble, he won't fall, but he'll continue on his course by faith. Here really is the peak of faith, the peak of faith. Here's the faith that we, even as God's people, can know. The Lord God is his strength. The Lord God is his salvation. The one who empowers him and delivers him and so enables him to go on with joy. He believes that the one who says, I am that I am, God, the Lord, Jehovah, is the one who ultimately, in the end, will not fail him. The covenant-keeping God will not fail him. Habakkuk has come into this, this best place, 
the best place for the child of God. Now, he's not the only one who's found this happy place, found this best place. Job, look at that man Job, what trials that man knew. A righteous man, yet he lost everything. He lost his wealth, his health, his children. And eventually he starts to feel, well, God has cast me away. God won't listen to me. And yet again, God in his great kindness, eventually, according to his own timing, he comes to his servant and he answers him. Again, not perhaps in the way Job expected, but in a way which is enough for Job. He shows him his wondrous wisdom and power, how all creation from the stars to the sea, whether in the land or in the air, whether rain or rivers, snow or seasons, lion or ox, bear or ostrich, horse or eagle, all have been created by God. A wise God and appointed by God and show his great wisdom and his care. And as a result of such a revelation of God, Job, like Habakkuk, comes into that happy place that blessed place he says I know that you can do everything I lay my hand over my mouth once I've spoken but I will not answer yes twice but I will no proceed no further I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eye sees you therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes it comes that place of trust and confidence in his Lord even in his circumstances that are so dire and here's another believer here's another believer in the word of God he's an impetuous zealot pursuing those he hates in the heat of the Palestinian midday sun he's got a zeal for the law which outweighs his contemporaries and yet he stopped in his tracks. The one who went to arrest Christ's followers is himself arrested by Christ. And he's converted. And eventually we find this man waiting for three and a half years under arrest. Two years under house arrest, then one and a half years in prison, waiting for a hearing. Anything he had need of had to be provided from his own resources. It wasn't like the prisons of today where you get everything the state provides for you. In those days, if you had no relatives outside to provide or friends, you didn't get anything. Some died of starvation waiting to actually have their, court, their case heard. Paul, he requests blankets, pillows. Uh, he, he would have no doubt requested these things. And we read of him, don't we, of Paul being dependent on the mercy of others. Before we come to this, this man had known weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, in cold and nakedness. Uh, yet in all this, this man, this apostle Paul, was facing cold and hunger and even death. Will tell us what? What will he tell us? He'll tell us he's found the best place. He's found the best place. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I've learned both to be full and hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Just like Habakkuk, just like Job, Paul had learned to trust in God regardless of his circumstances, rely on God, and so find this peace. Find the best place for the child of God. Now these things are not just for them. We can think, oh well, that's them, and that's their experience. No, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patient, patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. The challenge is this, isn't it, for us tonight? Our third point, the challenge is this. Do we know the best place? Have we found the best place? We all face great trials, don't we, and tribulation as the people of God. We, through much tribulation, will inherit the kingdom of God. It's inevitable. 
The, wealth and, uh, the health and wealth gospelers don't tell you that, do they? They say it's all going to be sunshine and everything will be fine. It's not. That's not what the word of God says. Now, at times when we face these tribulations, we can be comforted because we can see what God is doing. We have some understanding of what God is teaching us or how he's working the situation out for his own glory. And yet, you know, some things, some things are so left field, so unexpected, so harsh, so difficult. We're like Habakkuk, we're even like Job. We're confused. What is God doing? It seems so contrary to how we feel that God should act or even the character of God. The cancer that is suddenly found, the child that suddenly gets ill and dies, the husband who suddenly deserts his wife, the prospect of never being married, that persistent weakness or illness, the sorrows over wayward loved ones, the consequences that others bring upon us. So even in such great trials, my friend, have we known what it is to get to Habakkuk's best place? Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. You might say, well, such a place is impossible to find. We can never find such a place. Yet do you know God wants us to get there? He wouldn't have shown us such a place if it was impossible to find. And you know, it brings great glory to God when we can, when we can rest in this place. And also, you know, in his love, he knows it's the most happy place for us to be as the people of God, the most peaceful, the most tranquil, the most blessed place for his dear child can be in the place that Habakkuk found. And yet, you know, there's often a journey that we have to go through to get to that place. And sometimes we have to repeat the steps over and over again to get there, to get back there. Notice here it was only after Habakkuk had seen the wonderful person of God, the God to whom he belonged, that he found this place. Has God shown you the wonder of his person? Can you not consider the wonder of the person of God? Look at that cross. Look at the cross. Look at the one there dying, dying that accursed death for you. God gave him up for you. He gave him up to punish your sins, to satisfy his justice and remove them and show, so show you his love and his mercy and his grace. That cross is like a letter that a woman keeps from her husband, which he gave her before he left, in which he states his great love for her. When he's out of view, when he's gone, she's ever bringing it out. She's ever turning to that letter and finding it a comfort, reminding herself of his love, of his concern until the day when he will most surely return. So the cross to us, that's how it is. It's that statement. It's that revelation of the love of God for you. It says, look how much I love you. Look how much I care for you. Look how much my care is that there is this divine care, this concern. And it asks, having given this for you, no greater gift that God could give. Can you doubt my care? Can you doubt my concern? Yet we also look there at the cross and we see his wonderful wisdom, the wisdom of God. Who could work so as to use the wickedness of men and of Satan so as to achieve his great divine purpose? Who could do that? So order it in his wisdom that the very act of men and Satan used 
To destroy the Christ, in fact, is that which becomes their downfall and their destruction. Can we then doubt the wisdom of the one who is leading us? The one who has his hand upon us, who's guiding us? Do we think he's got confused, befuddled? And everything is utterly out of control in our lives? No, it's not. He's eternally wise. He's leading us. And how dark was that cross, wasn't it? How dark the cross was. The utter disarray the disciples were in. Everything had crashed down. The blackness, the darkness is how we feel our lives can be at times. Everything seems to have crashed down around our ears. And yet through it all, God was at work. God was working out his purpose. God brought about the greatest of outcomes, the light of the defeat of the darkness, of the powers of darkness, and the conquest of the resurrection. All came as a result of that terrible dark day, as it seemed there at first. And so, do you know what he'll do in the end with you, my friend? The God of the cross loves you. He cannot let you go. The God of the cross has all wisdom. He's ordering all things. The God of the cross will eventually bring you into a broad place, a wonderful place, whether in this life or in the next. He will deliver you in the end. And he'll bring you into that place. Do we want to come to this most blessed places? Most blessed place, Habakkuk's place. How can we make for that place when we're so assailed well, we'll find at times we will be perplexed, we'll be distraught. But as we've said, those who find this place, well, they have an increasing appreciation of the revelation of God and of the cross of Christ. And they come back regularly. They return regularly to the foot of the cross. And they meditate often on what God is saying to them. And about them, his dear child, through the cross. They're those who have an increasing familiarity with God's word. They've learned over the years that this God is true to his promise. He promised to send his son, he sent him. And they realise, as Habakkuk realised, as he took comfort from the word of God, he lived by that scripture that God gave him. So we start to live by the scriptures. In your book, they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. What a comfort that is to know everything that we go through is ordained of God it's written in his book he knows the way that I take and when I come forth when I am uh, tested I shall come forth as gold as for God his way is perfect he himself has promised I will never leave you nor forsake you fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you by my righteous right hand and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so you see, the one who finds Habakkuk's happy place, they know the word. They cling to the promises. They've learned the word. They've taken it to their hearts, and they start to prove their power. And so they start to be able to trust God, even amidst the great difficulties of life. Those who find Habakkuk's place, they're prayerful. Like Habakkuk, they know what it is to lay it all out before God. Habakkuk did. He laid it all out before God. He brought it to God. They have the conviction, well, he hears and he knows. Sadly, you know, some will never find Habakkuk's place, the best place, because you see, they're looking to the wrong things for their security, for their peace, and for their joy. They're clutching the wrong thing to their heart which cannot in the end really give them that security and peace that they need. It may be they're looking to a person. They're looking to their money. They're looking to their home, their loved ones, their family. They put great store in these and they say, well, that'll be my comfort. That'll be my strength. And you know, in the end, even these things fail. They're looking to the wrong things. If you're looking to these th things, you'll never find Habakkuk's place. The best place, such a place, is found by those like Habakkuk who look beyond the temporary things of this world and they look to the Lord and they look to the God of Habakkuk and his promises. He who walks by faith and trusts in this God finds that even the arrows of life, as Habakkuk said, don't bring them down. 
Some don't find this place Habakkuk's place because they believe that God is never right to allow any trial. And somehow God owes them something. So really God owes us nothing. All we deserve is God's wrath. And whatever he might give us in his grace is never really what we deserve. And yet, we unworthy sinners who fail God every day, this God can be so gracious to us. This God is yet able to bless us in the way that he blessed Habakkuk, in bringing him into this place of contentment and peace as he trusted in the Lord, as he trusted in his God. Are you trusting in the wrong props? Are you looking to the wrong comforts and help? When you have a God who loves you, a God who sent his son, who's died for you, a God who is numbering your days, a God whose word is sure and whose promises are true. He loves you with the same love with which he loves his son. Amazing. It is true. Can't you make him the strength of your heart? Won't you look to him? In all, may we be those who find that we rest in Habakkuk's place. We find Habakkuk's best, best, best place. All things are working together for good to those who love God. My God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, all that we need? by way of grace and by way of strength. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. May we take such scriptures, such promises, may we bind them upon our hearts. And so we, may we be those who find Habakkuk's best place. That trust, that faith that Habakkuk had in the end, God so dealing with us that we know what it is to find that place of contentment and peace and joy and trusting in the Lord the Lord knows. The Lord is leading. This wise God, this God who cares for me, who's given his son, he's got his hand upon me. May we look to him. May we trust him. May we find Habakkuk's best place. We know that joy and peace which God alone can give. And so glorify him. Amen.